On the program, we've got Liberal frontbencher Mitch Firefield and Labor frontbencher Michelle Rowland. You must be pleased, Senator Firefield, to see those those numbers come back. I know we're a long way out in terms of the electoral cycle, but encouraging to see that your message is being heard. Well, Kieran, we uh, don't want to be in the business of being commentators in the polls, but uh, I think uh, suffice to say that uh, there was a general election uh, not long ago. Uh, there was a very uh, strong result for the coalition. Uh, there was a clear mandate uh, for our policies. And uh, as a manager of government business in the Senate, um, I think there's a message here uh, for the Australian Labor Party, and that is um, get out of the way. Uh, let us repeal the carbon tax. Uh, let us repeal the mining tax. Uh, that's what the people voted for. Well, overwhelmingly good news for the coalition. You heard what John Sturton had to say there at the end. What about uh, Tony Abbott personally? Is that just the legacy of being around for so long? He's such a known quantity. Well, Kieran, um, uh, Tony Abbott uh, has been someone who has never uh, had an eye to the poll. Uh, he's someone who has uh, set out an agenda uh, for the benefit of the Australian people. Uh, he's going to do what's right uh, and that's what he's focused on. Michelle Rowland, nearly 70% of the people surveyed in this poll, 1,400 uh, individuals surveyed, 67% support the idea of a Royal Commission into the unions. Did Bill Shorten get it wrong on this one? I think Bill Shorten's been very clear and Labor's been very consistent about what we think should be happening in this area if the government wishes to take action. And that is that if we have such a problem with corruption, then we should refer it to the highest body possible rather than have a Royal Commission, which will take an extended period of time. But also I think we need to look at things like the cost of this, but also in previous Royal Commissions, whether we have actually had prosecutions and results. And I think that Bill Shorten's been very clear about this. I also think that if uh, Mitch and the Liberal Party want to gloat about these results, be my guest, be my guest, because nothing pleases me more than to see no a government in hubris, seeing a government that is arrogant and out of touch. And I'll tell you what figures really matter, Kieran, and that is the number of jobless people that have been left under this government in barely five months. What, what about the shortened approval, though? It's down 11 points in only a couple of months. You might be encouraged by what he's saying, but it doesn't seem a lot of people uh, surveyed, a lot of people in the electorate agree with you. Bill Shorten's barely been Labor leader for five months. I mean, we had a time there when we went through our own processes of selecting uh, the leader. And I think that Bill, in a very short period of time, has managed to be someone whom the public has gotten to know. He's worked very hard on that. He campaigned personally very hard in Griffith, a seat which the pundits actually said Labor was going to lose. He campaigned very hard there and very effectively. And I think that as time goes on, as Labor lets the public know and develops our policies in key areas of reform, I think that people will come to understand that they can have something better than a Liberal government which breaks so many promises in less than five months. Mitch Fifield to the drought tour of the Prime Minister's conducting at the moment. Obviously we saw those pictures yesterday, remarkable rainfall, uh, the first for, for many, many months. There was one child who'd never seen it before at, at one of the properties Tony Abbott had visited. But pictures are fine. It's going to be the dollars that count. At a time when you're trying to save uh, and, and, and cut spending, will enough be provided here for, for what is, I think, both sides of politics agree, a much needed boost to drought assistance? Well, Kieran, uh, you know, I, I think you, you've seen and the Australian people have seen that uh, Barnaby Joyce and, uh, and the Prime Minister, uh, they, they don't carry lightly uh, the, uh, the issues that are facing uh, Australians uh, on the land. Um, uh, what we need to have is, is a fair uh, and a responsible uh, package. Uh, Australians are very generous people uh, and Australians, uh, uh, I think, often do have uh, those on the land in their minds when times are tough. So Cabinet will, uh, will look at, uh, at the issue uh, and they will come forward uh, with a plan that's, uh, that's fair uh, and that's also responsible. And, and what about the sustainability issue? I know that, uh, that Tony Abbott, among others, has referred to this in terms of properties receiving the assistance and, and farmers receiving the assistance about uh, making sure that these are on a sustainable footing into the future.
Is that something that the Cabinet is, uh, is very much cognisant of? Look, the Cabinet wants to do uh, what it can uh, to help. Uh, Australians on the land, uh, they, they don't want uh, welfare. Uh, they, they want support to help them get back on their feet. Uh, and I think that's what will frame uh, the discussions of the Cabinet. And there is bipartisan support for this, isn't there, Michelle Rowland, in terms of drought assistance? In fact, Bill Shorten saying that he would have preferred it bit to be done sooner. Do it doesn't make sense, though, for Tony Abbott to go there, take some soundings from, from people firsthand. It's one thing to do a, a tour of drought affected areas, but I think the reality is that we all know that this is a dire situation. And we had an opportunity in the Parliament last week to actually bring forward some legislation on this matter, but we had a ridiculous situation where the government actually ran out of legislation to be debated. We should have brought it on then. I'll also make the point, Kieran, that we've had cuts to the farm finance scheme already. $40 million worth of cuts in that area. Actions do speak louder than words, and I'm sure that the people on the land who are being affected would agree with me. We've got to go to a break, and we'll be right back with Michelle Rowland and Senator Mitch Fifield. Stay with us. Count the number of batteries you rely on every day. Now multiply it by 7.6 million households. As the demand for battery power increases, plan for a positive future today with your own Battery World franchise. This summer, Pepsi Next is hitting the road and inviting Australia to take part in the ultimate head-to-head -head taste challenge. Does naturally less sugar Pepsi Next taste better than full sugar Coke? Let your taste decide. Pepsi Next. Naturally less sugar. Take a holiday from high interest rates. Transfer your existing credit card balance to a new Jetstar Platinum MasterCard and pay only 2.99% interest on that amount for nine months. And if you apply by March 31, you'll save $80 on the first year annual fee and pay only $69. And you'll receive a $100 Jetstar flight voucher if you make a purchase on the card by May 31, 2014. Conditions, fees and charges apply. For more details and to apply, visit Jetstar.com. The beautiful people of the world have a secret. Well, when you add Zouche to your food, you make yummy face. And when you make the yummy face, you beautify you. Zouche dressing in mayonnaise, the secret to beautiful food. It's time to move to a lower home loan rate. And BOQ's new clear path rate is lower than the big bank standard variable rate. Visit boq.com.au forward slash compare to see for yourself. Gavin? <laughs> Have you been up all night? I'm looking for hotel deals. 30% discount with breakfast. There's a 20% discount with the spa. 40%! Why didn't you just go to hotels combined? They can bear hundreds of travel sites in seconds. <sighs> Compare hundreds of sites to find the best price in seconds at hotelscombined.com. Gear up this season. When you buy specially marked Gatorade, you can collect points to get the same Gatorade gear now seen on the sidelines of the AFL. Get Gatorade gear. Get it now. With its stunning design, rugged performance, maximum five-star safety, and award-winning value, it's no wonder the seven-seat Santa Fe is again Australia's best SUV winner. Who gives you Australia's best SUV between 45 and 65,000? We do. Hyundai. This is AIM Agenda with me this morning. Labor frontbencher Michelle Rowland and the Manager of Government Business in the Senate. Liberal Senator Mitch Fifield. Now to the Manus Island disturbance uh, that we've seen last night, late yesterday, Mitch Fifield. We, 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 as I read the statement from Scott Morrison earlier in the piece, a number of asylum seekers, transferees, have received medical treatment. Um, according to the reports that he's received, PNG police have made some arrests. Is this, is this sort of tension inevitable, given the, the, the group of people, a thousand plus, 
know what's in store for them now? Well, it's not entirely clear at this stage what has happened. We, we do know that there was a disturbance overnight. We do know that there are reports uh, of some transferees having received medical attention. Uh, there are some reports of transferees having been arrested. Uh, but uh, the Department of, of Immigration will uh, confirm uh, what the situation was uh, when they get further details. Is this, is this, though, inevitable collateral damage almost for a, a policy which is hard line. We heard the, the PM again reiterate that at the start of the program in that comment on the ABC. He's been on 2GB again this morning making the same point that if people come here illegally that that is what they can expect to be to be uh, faced with immigration detention. We make no policy for, for being resolute. We make no policy uh, for offshore processing. Uh, I just wish that the former government had come around to it uh, sooner. Uh, you might recall, Kieran, that th they spent three or four years uh, or longer saying offshore processing was essentially immoral. Um, in the end, uh, reality hit them in the face and even they uh, had to uh, come on board with offshore, offshore processing. But we, we don't apologise for being firm. We don't apologise for making it clear to the people smugglers, we're going to put them out of business. Michelle Rowland, no successful boat arrival in, well, eight weeks now. It shows that that hard line, that deterrence is, is working, doesn't it? The policy uh, agenda that was put in place by Labor in July last year has been the single biggest circuit breaker. I think the statistics have also shown that the biggest decline actually came immediately after Labor implemented this policy. So Labor is as pleased as anyone that the government is continuing to have as a central policy platform, the central part of this which is working, is the offshore processing scheme that Labor put in place. In terms of this Manus Island disturbance though, I'll put the same question that I put to Senator Firefield, is that sort of thing inevitable given the, the tough circumstances and also uh, the, the knowledge that the individuals concerned won't ever make it to Australia and will be resettled, if they're lucky, in PNG. One would hope that it's not inevitable because we, as Labor, want to see the flow of boats stopped and we are pleased to see that this policy is working. And if we have a situation where the things like the advertisements, the publicity scheme offshore is actually having a deterrent effect, as well as the people smugglers business model being broken as a result of that, then Labor wants to see that happen uh, more than anyone. So we are pleased to see that the policy settings are working. One would hope that it's not an inevitability that these kinds of things occur. And as Richard Mulls, the opposition spokesperson, said this morning, it is not an easy job administering these offshore arrangements. Marty Natalagawa, the Indonesian Foreign Minister, Senator Firefield, he will be raising his concerns about the Australian border protection policies with the US Secretary of State. This shows that while some are pleased, Labor's pleased that the, the boat arrivals have stopped, that uh, certainly the Indonesians aren't so happy with the way that you're going about it, i.e with the, the lifeboats and the turnbacks? Well, we've always been uh, up front uh, with the, uh, the Indonesian government uh, about our determination to, uh, to stop the people smuggling trade. Uh, we are putting in place the, the policies that we said we would. Um, obviously, uh, Indonesia and uh, the United States can uh, discuss whatever issues they like. Uh, so we're very comfortable with that, but we're going to continue to pursue the policies that are working. But if he's going to be taken up with the US Secretary of State, this Jakarta-focused foreign policy that the Prime Minister had wanted isn't going too well, is it, right now? That is just, that is one, uh, one, uh, I suppose, victim of that tough line that the, the boats might be stopping, but the relations with Indonesia with Jakarta are not going so well. well. I think you've got to look at the entirety of the bilateral relationship, and uh, I heard Julie Bishop uh, just the other day saying that uh, she talks to the Indonesian Foreign Minister uh, on just about a daily basis. So uh, the lines of communication uh, are there; uh, they are open. Uh, we are we are talking to our partners in Indonesia, uh, and we're going to continue to pursue what the policies that. Uh, look like uh, they're being extremely effective. Michelle, the Prime Minister said he's thrilled that Indonesia and the US can have a candid discussion on Australian immigration policy. He's certainly not worried about it. Kieran, you've highlighted the significant difference between the policy implementation under Labor and under this government. What a sorry state of affairs it is that we have our nearest neighbour, such an important uh, country in our area, particularly important to a successful, uh, our successful policies in this area, actually calling on Washington 
to have to deal with Australia. It is a sorry state of affairs when we have reached such a level when that has to occur. And this kind of low point in the relationship didn't happen under Labor, did not happen under Labor. And how many times did I sit here on your program and many others and get lectured by then members of the opposition about how Labor had destroyed the relationship with Indonesia, how the Liberals were going to make it so much better. Well, we see the proof here and now, and is that we have plumbed, plumbed to such depths that we have Marty Nadalagawa calling on John Kerry to assist with relations with Australia. I don't want to get caught up in the... the I know what Senator Fifield was going to say about the live cattle trade, but it took the words out of my mouth. Let's, I want to move on from there because, you know, I think we've d discussed this issue enough in terms of border protection. I do want to ask you, though, about this issue on the spying front because this is something both sides of politics have to, I, I suppose, accept accountability for because it happened under the Gillard government, this latest leak from Snowden. Uh, reported in the New York Times that Australia assisted a US law firm representing Indonesia, uh, the, the Australian intelligence agencies um, gathered intelligence ag against this law firm representing Indonesia in a trade dispute with the US. It, it, it just says that it goes into every facet of, of the relationship, doesn't it? Even the economic relationship being monitored. Well, Kieran, uh, it's the practice uh, of all Australian governments not to uh, comment on intelligence matters, and I'm sure Michelle would agree with that. Uh, but uh, the Australian government, uh, regardless of, of who is in office, uh, the, the information that it gathers from its intelligence sources is not used to the detriment of, of other nations. Uh, so uh, you know, we are fortunate in that uh, we do have uh, very robust accountability mechanisms for our intelligence agencies, and uh, I think the Australian people can have confidence in that. Michelle Rowland, Finally, on uh, that issue, do you accept that from the government, that explanation? Look, I'm not privy to uh, the details of this matter, and certainly it is the practice of both governments and opposition not to comment on national security matters. I think that it's very important for the opposition to receive a briefing on this matter, which is what's been requested, and my understanding is that that has been granted. But I think at the end of this, it's very important to recognise that Australia's relationship with Indonesia under this government has certainly not has certainly not been the good relationship that it was under Labor. And Senator Fifield, finally, you're the minister responsible for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Four trial sites of, uh, are, are being rolled out. Tell me, what's the latest in terms of the costs? My understanding is that they they have fallen away a bit. That things are looking a bit better in terms of the forecasts. Yeah, look, the, the first quarter uh, of the, the trial sites found that average package costs were about 30% higher than was anticipated. Uh, in the second quarter, uh, they're down to about 15% uh, above what was anticipated. Uh, now, you've got to be careful uh, not to uh, extrapolate to the, the full scheme rollout, uh, a quarterly result, because some people um, receive uh, supports uh, on a one-off basis, uh, others uh, on a year-in, year-out basis, but it's important still to keep a weather eye on the sustainability of the scheme early up. Uh, the other uh, thing that uh, we've found is that there were some errors uh, in the bilateral agreements negotiated by the previous government uh, so that uh, it looks like uh, there could be additional costs of about $392 million uh, over the launch phase of the scheme. But, but the, the coalition is 100% committed to rolling the NDIS out in full? even despite those cost overruns? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, and those errors in the bilateral, uh, although uh, they apply to the trial sites, uh, those particular things have been factored into uh, the full scheme cost. We're almost out of time, but just finally, in terms of the early trial sites, is it true that those the most profoundly disabled are involved in those trial sites, therefore the costs inherently will be more? Look, there, there could be uh, some uh, unique factors to do with the, the characteristics of, uh, of individuals who are coming in uh, to the trial sites initially, and, and that's part of uh, what we're going to be doing, is, is looking at uh, distilling those numbers to find out the reasons why. Senator Fifield, thanks so much for that. Thank you. And Michelle Rowland, appreciate your time as well this morning. A quick